Welcome. After that wonderful little break where we went to China and when we went to Latin America, most notably the Andes, you know, in South America and the Valley of Mexico in Mexico, we're back to Europe because this class pretty much stresses or, you know, um, stresses, yes, Western art. And uh, we are in the 18th century. We've kind of left behind the Renaissance, the Baroque of the 1600s, and now we're in the 18th century, that means the 1700s. And this is a very, very difficult moment, a transformative moment for Europe, and the art reflects it. Remember we said art is truth and beauty? Truth is from the caves, the ability to copy what you see, you know, all the way through the archaic, you know, uh, Egypt, people trying to do bodies, people trying to depict and sculpt, and uh, you know, the, the natural world. And then the Greeks appear and they make it ideal. They take what they look at and they make it even more beautiful. They make it ideal. So that's beauty, right? I beauty. And now, in this, you know, 18th century, 1700s, we have wars, we have upheavals, we have revolutions, we have the transitions from monarchies, from single bosses or single rulers into governments that are more democratic, where more people are involved. And in that transition comes what? Criticality. Art is truth plus beauty divided by criticality. The criticality is the distance that people are taking, the suspicion that you're not being told the truth, the idea that nothing is as it is presented to you by the kings or by the church, but that you have to be critical, that you have to take a standpoint and you have to analyze things on your own, as I hope you are doing with this class and with anything that you read and with any educational opportunity that you get. In any case, um, this 1700s, you know, um, are, you know, a European and American philosophy sort of flourish because by now the Americas have been established as an outpost of European society, an outpost of European society where wealth is created even if the original inhabitants are subjected to the most abusive slavery and rejection. Uh, again, also the Americans are a great place for money because besides the natives being subjected to misery, you also have brought Africans over to also work for free, right? So other people, Europeans namely, can make the money. So that's the 1700s, you know, hundreds. that's the 18th. And basically in France, in Britain and Germany, you know, they are creating a new philosophy. They're creating new philosophies of government, you know, that are about no nobles, no kings, okay? We're about, we're all together. We're going to determine how to rule our country or our area best. Now, you know, in this time, this is the age of reason. It's called the age of reason, but it's also the age of revolution where there's all these upheavals. And there are three great revolutions that I want you to remember. They come in the second half, 1776. The shot heard around the world, a bunch of British uh, uh, descendants here in the United States of America, in Boston, decide to flick the finger at the British monarchy and say, no, sir, we're not gonna pay your taxes. We're gonna keep our taxes for ourselves, you know, to King George. That's the first revolution, and that creates America, or the United States of America, in this case, becomes its own country, independent of Europe. Later on, Latin America, the Spanish-speaking portions of our America, will also become independent in their respect from Spain. Then we have 1789, the French Revolution. Liberty, equality, fraternity, they kill the king, Remember that king we saw with the perfume and the wigs, you know, uh, Louis XIV, the absolute monarch, the most powerful man in Europe. Well, his grandson is taken, his neck is cut, his, wife is, uh, his, his wife's neck is also cut, and all for the people, the common people, the third estate, 
to be able to also govern themselves. This is in France. But of course, France wants freedom, France wants equality, France wants, uh, you know, brotherhood. But they have slaves. They have a small colony in the Caribbean called Saint Domingo. Saint Domingo is called Haiti today, and it was the richest colony of all the Spaniards and Cuba and uh, and all the and Puerto Rico and all the islands, Jamaica for the British. Haiti was the richest colony because they treated uh, the African slaves like machines. Uh, you know, you work, you work until you drop dead, and then we bring another one. So even though the French are clamoring for their own freedom and their own independence from the monarchs, they want this little chunk of change in the Caribbean that produces wealth for the French. And the Haitians exploded. After listening to all this talk about liberté, égalité, and fraternité, the slaves that are serving the food, the slaves that get whipped to death in the, in the plantation, they explode. They kill everything that's white and moves, and they do the Haitian Revolution, okay? 1791, pardon me, I'm not gonna take that. 1791 to 1804. So what's going on? What's going on? This is the age of revolution. You have an industrial revolution in, in, in also in England. England has its own more democratic uh, uh, sort of government, more representation by the people. And you have, you know, then the industrial revolution, the creation of machines that speed up, you know, the production of things. So we have two movements, two movements that come up. And one is, you know, neoclassicism, which is kind of classic, going back to the classic, and romanticism. These are the two movements that coexist in the second half of the 18th century, the 1700s. I would like you to remember, for the neoclassical style, Jacques-Louis David from France. He was a great painter, academic painter, he liked um, the subjects of classical antiquity, but he was a revolutionary. He gets involved in the French Revolution and he eventually creates one of the most important paintings of that revolution. He shows a revolutionary killed in his bathtub, the death of Marais. Here, look at the death of Marais. And this is a very powerful neoclassic painting. Look how empty it is, look how clean, Look how clear you have the narrative, the death of Marat by Jacques-Louis David. Now, at the same time, in this, you know, 1700s, just like we are talking about classicism, neoclassicism, you have this romantic attitude called romanticism, and it starts in Germany, and it's about Sturm and Drang, all right, turmoil and dislocation. It is, and you have heard about romantic. It comes from the novels, you know, novels that started in Spain and the adventures of knights. And basically you have this incredible, incredible desire to sort of break free from society. Society is evil. Society is full of evils. And some of the greatest romantic painters are in Spain, or the greatest romantic painter to me is in Spain. His name is Francisco Goya y Lucientes. Also, like Jacques Louis David, he is um, politically inclined. And take a look at some of his work, you know, where he's looking at the invasion of his country by the French, because the French invaded Spain. And, you know, and at the same time that he's painting like this, we also have this multicultural fascination in France. France becomes very, it becomes very fashionable midway through the 1700s to drink tea in France. And they copy, they think the Chinese are cute and they put wallpaper with Chinese motifs and, uh, and people drink tea and people have Chinese furniture. Additionally, the Arab world calls uh, France and you have this uh, orient orientalist, but not from the Far East, but from the Near East. And you have, here's the Grand Odalisk by, um, by none other than Angs, okay? The Grand Odalisk by Angs. Please take a look at that. And you know, at this time, you also have, you know, 
um, you also have the United States where people are starting to, to get, you know, sophisticated painting like in Europe and you have this thing called the uh, Hudson School where they're painting landscapes and celebrating the American tradition. Enjoy the paintings. We'll talk next week.